Let's talk about how heat capacity is related to enthalpy and entropy. So we saw before that heat capacity is a property of materials. It's given by the symbol C and it relates uh, how much a transfer of heat into the system will change the temperature of the system. For constant pressure processes, we saw that uh, the heat transferred at constant pressure is equal to the change in enthalpy, and that for constant volume processes, the heat transferred is equal to the change in the internal energy. Uh, so this gave us then the relationships between heat capacity and enthalpy or internal energy. So we had that uh, delta Q at constant P was N C P D T, uh, and this also then is equal to dH, and that uh, delta Q at constant volume was N C V dt and that this was equal to du. So we are going to uh, work primarily with this equation here to start with because it's a lot easier to operate at constant pressure than it is at constant volume. So this relationship right here is the one that we are going to build on uh, in what comes up. Let's talk for a minute though about what really is heat capacity. So we saw that in ideal gas systems, heat capacity was a constant. In general, it's not a constant. So let's take a look at um, real materials. So in general, Cp is a function of T. It's not a constant. And we can look at an example of that. So this is a plot of the heat capacity in the units of joules per mole Kelvin, which is, are the units of heat capacity as a function of temperature. And this is for carbon. And so you can see sort of the scale of the units. Clearly, this is not a constant, although as it gets up to higher temperatures, it starts to be somewhat more constant. In order to make it easier, I suppose, to tabulate these, and because materials behave somewhat similarly, the function for heat capacity is generally given as this. So A plus BT plus CT to the negative 2. Need a little more room here. Plus DT squared. And then instead of sort of having to have the whole entire function for every material, the values of A, B, C, and D are what are tabulated in handbooks for any given sort of range of temperatures for materials. It isn't always that complicated. Uh, sometimes it's as simple as A plus B, T, uh, or sometimes a plus BT plus C T minus 2. Sometimes, in fact, just the constant is enough. Um, we'll talk in class a little bit more about why different materials have different values of heat capacity, but these are specific to different materials. Now, I want to just mention here one last note, and that is regarding how these are tabulated. So in the appendices of the textbooks, the values for B are listed as B times 10 to the 3 and C times 10 to the minus 5. And this can sometimes be uh, confusing. So what this means is that B is um, the value given but times 10 to the negative third, right? So if the value for B, let's say, is given as 
11.5, then what you would put into that function is actually 0 0.0115. And for C, it's really the value given times 10 to the fifth. Okay, so let's use heat capacity to understand about the enthalpy of a material. Right, so the enthalpy dH is given by ncp dt, where the lowercase c here indicates that it is the molar heat capacity. H, the enthalpy, is, we can think of it as sort of measuring a change in the thermal energy if it's at constant pressure. Right, so at constant P, delta H equals Q. So if we have a question that says, at constant pressure, how much heat is needed, then what we really want to do is that we want to calculate the enthalpy. Right, so uh, these questions that say how much heat is needed to heat this from here to there, this is where we come to try to answer that. So if we want to find delta H, we just simply integrate the right-hand side of this equation from T1 to T2. Right? So let's take a look at how enthalpy normally varies with temperature. So this plot shows the enthalpy in kilojoules per mole as a function of temperature, and this is for titanium. Uh, enthalpy is sort of arbitrarily defined to be zero at 298K for all elements, and that's why this plot is starting at zero down here. We can notice a couple of things. We have this uh, jump here. This is where titanium is going from the alpha phase to the beta phase. Up here it's the liquid phase, so this is the enthalpy change associated with the melting. When there is a phase change taking place, like this one, uh, the enthalpy is going up but the temperature is not. This means heat is being added in to the system. In this case, heat is being added in to break the bonds of the solid and to form the liquid, but the temperature isn't changing. So that's one important thing to keep in mind about phase transformations. Uh, also, as we can see from our equation for enthalpy as a function of heat capacity, the slope of the line is related to the heat capacity. If we rearrange this, we have dH dt is equal to Cp. So the slope of the H versus T curve tells us a little bit about the heat capacity of the material. So let's look at an example. Calculate changes in enthalpy. And we will first do this without a phase transformation, and then we will do it considering that we have a phase transformation. So we want to find, let's say, delta H for one liter of water going from uh, 25 C to 100 degrees C, but not boiling, sort of just to the point before boiling. A couple of notes, we are going to take the heat capacity to be a constant value of 75 joules per mole Kelvin, and the molar mass of water we're going to approximate as 18 grams per mole. So we start out with our equation dH equals ncp ncp dt and we want to integrate both sides and so we end up with the uh, integral from 25 plus 273 because we need to be operating in Kelvin, 100 plus 373, of N times Cp dt, and N and Cp are constants, so we can bring them outside of the integral, and we only have to integrate the T, and so this is the integral then from 298 to 373 of 
Um, CP DT, which is just N CP T2 minus T1. So we need to plug in everything, and we can find that delta A is equal to, we have one liter of water, which is 1,000 grams, divided by the molar mass. This will give us N, and then CP, which is 75 joules per mole Kelvin, and then times 373 minus 298k, and in the end, this gives us an enthalpy change of 312,468 joules for one liter of water. Now, if we want to add in there the phase transformation, we can do that. So now we want to, let's say, find delta H for one liter water from 25 to 100 degrees C, including boiling. So we have sort of H versus T, and we just calculated this value here of delta H as we heat it up. But now when it boils, it has this enthalpy change here. This is something that you actually have to look up. And so in the case of water, the delta H for vaporization is 40.14 kilojoules per mole. So the total enthalpy change then is the enthalpy change that we calculated before for the heating up plus this uh, 40,000 joules. Let's put in our units here, joules and joules per mole. And then we just need to multiply by the number of moles that we have, which this works out to be about 55 moles. And this gives us a final delta H of 2,542,000 468 joules. So that actually, you know, is kind of a lot of energy if you think about it, just to boil one liter of water. Okay, so let's go. Heat capacity can allow us to find changes in entropy. So as a reminder, we have dH at constant P is TDS. And this is equal to NCP dt. So we can rearrange and we get that ds dt at constant pressure is equal to NCP divided by t. Or that ds is equal to NCP over t dt. This right here is the expression that we will use for calculating entropy changes. It's pretty straightforward if CP is a constant, and the example that we'll do here it will be. If CP isn't a constant, you actually need to integrate that function, right? Because you have to remember that CP generally looks something like this, and not that it's a constant. But we will work some examples where that's the case in class. where we calculate the entropy change, and let's consider our same one liter of water that we just considered in the last case. So one liter of water, and we want to know what is the entropy change as we heat it up from 25 C to 100 degrees C, but do not include the boiling part. So we start with ds is n cp over t dt. And we are going to integrate both sides of this. And we end up with delta S is equal to N and CP, because CP is a constant here. And then the integral of 1 over T dt. 
So this is just N C P L N of T evaluated at T2 and T1. So we have that delta S is N. So there's our number of moles. And here's our heat capacity, 75 joules per mole. OK. And then we have LN of 373 minus LN of 298. And here it's particularly important that you remember to use your temperatures in K. And when we make this calculation, we end up with delta S equals 935.35 joules per Kelvin. And the moles here and the moles here cancel out. And so we just end up with units of joules per Kelvin. Now, we can see the entropy change with the boiling step included. But we need to know how to deal with the entropy of the phase transformation. So the entropy is defined like this. And at constant P, then Q is equal to dH. So we can plug in dH for delta Q, and we get that dS equals to dH over T. At a phase transformation point, we are at constants T and P, which allows us to write this as delta S delta S equals delta H divided by T. So this is not generally true. Okay. It's worth noting this. This equation is not generally true, only true at the transformation temperature. Okay. But it's useful because then if we know the delta H of the transformation, which we do for water, and we know the T, which we do for water, again, we can easily find this delta S. So let's make that example. So delta S, if we are going from 25C to 100C with boiling of one liter water, Delta S is equal to, we found that just the heating up part is 935.35 joules per, per Kelvin. And now we have this uh, delta H, which is 40,140 joules. The temperature where that happens is 373K. And then we just need to multiply that by the number of moles that we have. And we end up, this term here is 107.6 joules per mole K. And so we end up with a final value of delta S, which is 6913.9 joules per Kelvin. Uh, if you're trying to get a sense for these numbers, this feels a little bit high. I said before that entropy changes are usually on the order of single um, joule per mole Kelvin up to maybe 100, but we need to keep in mind here that we have 55 moles. So if we have 55 moles, this answer turns out to be reasonable. So that's how we can use heat capacity to calculate changes in enthalpy using this equation, where we might need to integrate this function of Cp, if it's a function of T, and for entropy, this relationship here.